The Jazz have rounded out their roster, so what do the new signings mean, and how will it impact the youthful Utah Jazz? Find out next on Locked on Jazz. You are Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into Locked On Jazz. I'm Leif Tulin. Excited to be back with you filling in for David Locke on Locked On Jazz. You guys know me by now, but if you don't, I'm a lifelong jazz fan who's a credentialed NBA draft analyst for Locked On NBA Big Board, attendee of both the 2023 and 2024 NBA Draft Combine, jazz broadcast assistant and statistician for the past three seasons, lover of college hoops. So don't expect all the col- uh, the, the geeky numbers that you are accustomed to listening to David Locke. Uh, to to go away, you'll get some. They'll be different, but I, I've been doing some of his stats for the past three seasons on broadcast. So I'll bring a unique perspective of someone who really loves watching college basketball, who, who, allowing me to see a lot of Cody Williams, a lot of Isaiah Collier, and all these guys. So I'll try, I'll try to explain to you guys uh, what you're going to get in those guys, especially with the newest players coming to the Jazz, Patty Mills to the Utah Jazz, and that leads me to my question of the day. So thanks for making Locked on Jazz your first listen every day. And remember, Locked on Jazz is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube, where the best way to help us grow is simple. Just comment anything below, but answer this question today. Today's question is, where do the Jazz jazz find their minutes? So how many minutes per game does Patty Mills play? That's the question because I don't know. He hasn't played very much the past few years, and we'll discuss that. But does his mentorship matter all that much, or is it all about minutes per game and his play speaking as an example. So how many minutes will Patty Mills play? That's the question. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. As the playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone. Every day, all summer long, visit FanDuel.com to get started. All right, in the first segment, I'll talk about the Jazz's latest moves, including that of Patty Mills and signings and the financials and more, and just talk about how the Jazz have filled out their roster. In the second segment, I'll lay out my expectations for the newest Jazz men and explain how this will impact playing time for the rookies and just how much these guys will play and how much will the rookies play. Debate of, I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll debate the philosophy that has to be going through Jazz fans' heads as well as that of Will Hardy. That'll all be coming up next. So let's dive right in. So, uh, Woj wrote this free agent Patty Mills has agreed on a one year, $3.3 million deal uh, with the Utah Jazz. Sources told ESPN Mills will reunite with coach Will Hardy for his 16th season on a fully guaranteed deal. It's pretty simple. All that means is he's going to get paid his entire $3.3 million, And he's a veteran, played for Will Hardy before. You guys know this. Uh, for those who don't know a ton about Patty Mills, a little background is the 36 year old was originally selected by the Trailblazers in the second round of the 2009 draft. Um, that, that was a while ago. That was Steph Curry's draft. That was DeMar DeRozan. He's been in the league for a bit. Uh, he spent the majority of his career, especially the prime of his career, with the San Antonio Spurs, where he worked with the Jazz's Will Hardy, um, but obviously under pop throughout that time. And then the Australian guard has career averages of about nine points per game, a little over two assists, a little under two boards, while shooting 38% from three. That's the true catch, because these were not just catch-and-shoot wide open ones. He was flying off curls, and he can really shoot the ball. I think he's immediately the best shooter on the Jazz roster. Same in Lowry Markman. Uh, however, Mills hasn't played more than 40 games in the last two seasons, either of the last two. He'll add a veteran presence to the Jazz's young locker room and be a mentor to the young guards. The The guard is made, just for a fun fact here, he's played in a lot of playoff games, played in 98 playoff appearances, and won an NBA title with the Spurs in 2014, where he helped the Spurs beat the Miami Heat with LeBron James on it. Uh, he's from Canberra, Australia. Mills spent two seasons at St. Mary's and with Randy Bennett, the pipeline of Australians featuring Matthew Della Vadova, uh, Jock Landell, and many more Australians. Uh, he was part of the, the Australian pipeline, and he carved the way for the, the future of Australian pipeline to St. Mary's, which has been very successful. Um, but before declaring for the NBA draft, he was at St. Mary's. Since declaring and even throughout the, the time of the NBA, he's played for the Australian national team, including this past Olympics, where at the 2024 Olympics, he averaged 17 points per game in four appearances, and they went to overtime with Serbia, who pushed the United States to the brink. 
In fact, they were leading Australians were against Serbia by over 20 points. So not all that's horribly important. What is important is his mentorship to the youthful pieces, namely Keontae George, Isaiah Collier, and maybe some work with Cody Williams or Bryce Sensabaugh. I don't know how much he works with each player. I don't know who his his rook is going to be and, and who their vets are going to be. Those are probably already assigned, honestly. But he seems to be one of those guys who's got the maturity and uh, self-respect, knowing, you know, my, my prime's passed me. Let's help these guys. His presence does beg the question of will he take time away from those youngsters, and we'll, we'll discuss that later on. Other news that has surfaced since the last episode, which aired on Monday, the Jazz have signed for Babacar Sané. Uh, per team policy, the, team, the terms of the deal were not released, which to me means it's just a training camp invite. Uh, Sané spent two seasons with the Jazz, uh, with the G League unit, uh, excuse me, <laughs> with, uh, with G League Ignite, appearing in 46 total regular season games, 16 of which were starts. He averaged nine points per game and six rebounds in 22 minutes. Uh, he played alongside Ron Holland and Matas Buzelis, if you saw him that way. Sané is from Senegal. He also, the other way you could have seen him is if you saw him at the Summer League. I saw him in person, just helps you put name to a face. He's got a really good athletic body. Skill set, not quite as developed, but hey, there's a chance. I mean, a lot of fans have been clamoring for taking chances on those type of guys with this, with uh, with athleticism and the ability to change a game, dynamic athletes. They haven't all panned out, but many, many like that type of player. So to round out what the Jazz have done to fill out their roster, I've got a list for you. Drew Eubanks, 27 years old, spent his last season in Phoenix. He went to Oregon State, Was scored six points and five boards, over 323 games in the NBA uh, with the Spurs, Blazers, and Suns. Jazz have him. They officially signed him to a two-year deal. I talked about Svi Mikhailuk in the last episode. He's six foot seven, appeared in 41 games with the championship winning Celtics last year, averaged four points, shot 39% from three. Uh, he had his best year with Detroit a few years ago, though, and averaged nine points, shooting 41 from three. So he's an established shooter. He can really shoot the basketball. And I think there's a chance that Mikhailuk does play. Uh, Kyle Filipowski has officially signed this contract for the Jazz. And that was kind of weird. It took him quite a while to sign that contract. But the, the interesting part is it's a fully guaranteed deal. You don't see that too often for rookies in the second round. It's not un unprecedented, but I would say it's less frequent than you'd think to have a fully guaranteed deal uh, for as many years as Filipowski has it. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, if, you, if you're just tuning in randomly and you haven't been following, uh, he was the 37, 32nd pick, second rounder. He averaged 16 points and about nine boards at Duke over his two seasons there and really shined in the summer league. Uh, especially the Vegas Summer League, where he was the kind of a ball handling center who, who was very good offensively, and he's a lot of work to do defensively. But the Jazz are hoping he can emulate what Kelly Olynyk did very well. The Jazz also uh, brought back Johnny Juzang. He appeared in 20 games last season with the Jazz. He had 27 against the Warriors. That's probably the shining uh, moment of his career. He's a really good shooter, and he'll be there on the Jazz along with Mikhail Luke to kind of be pacers for the young guards. And I'll talk about that later. And lastly, Oscar Shibwe signed a two-way contract. Uh, he's a 6'9 forward, uh, rebounding machine. Absolutely dominant rebounder on the glass. Last year, he won the G League Rookie of the Year honors with the uh, Indiana G League team. Uh, he was on a two-way contract, so he's with the Pacers, bouncing back and forth between the Pacers and the G League team. Shibwe may have the best nose for the basketball I've ever seen. Gets every rebound that you can, you can imagine. Uh, so there's a motor there. Um, that leads me to my next point. The Jazz clearly prioritized the rebuild, meaning they didn't go after any established players, nor, nor the, the big game hunting that was teased by Danny Ainge. They, they went with unproven players. However, the direction is stylistically uh, is clear. Like the Jazz went for a couple shooters in Mikhail Luke and Juzang, and they went with seriously energetic, frenetic energy type of guys in Eubanks and um, and Shibwe. Guys who will just cl crash the glass and play hard. Like they're trying to set their culture and they're trying to give the opportunity for the youth to play. That's the way I read this. So what's next? Uh, it's how often the Jazz new signings will play versus how much the youngsters will play. That'll be a contentious battle for Jazz fans one that they will undoubtedly feel strongly about, as many have felt the rookies needed more time earlier in the past few seasons. And indications to me, and personally, point that way this year, that that the rookies will get more playing time sooner. Like, you would say, oh, Hendricks played a lot. Well, he played a lot for two and a half months. Uh, 
Sensabaugh played for the two months. Keontae played the entire season, but Ochag Baji the year before didn't play that much. So I think this year it's more clear that the Jazz are tanking from the start than it was the prior two seasons. I think that there's been a series of choices that have uh, led me to believe that. But Will Hardy will have to be proven that's the right move because these players that assigned do have a certain set of skills. They have strengths. So that debate will be discussed next with quite a quote from Will Hardy that I dug up to lend insights on what is to come. I love sports. I love them so much I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel let, keeps me post, lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all the customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel and start making the most of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the Major League Baseball. Thank you, guys. I, I also just want to tell you guys, thank you. But but first, let me tell you guys about Intercap Lending, and you'll thank me. One of the largest independent lending con uh, companies in the country. It's not just a Utah thing. Like it, It's big. There's 44 states that they are a direct issuer in. Not Utah, but they make you feel like it's small because they take care of you. It, it feels like a family. It really does. And you think, oh, well, this must be just a Utah thing. No, 44 states, tremendous success everywhere. One of the largest independent lending companies. They're hyper responsive, embrace change, grow with the times as opposed to stay rooted in their initial thoughts. And you have testimonials of incredible borrower experience, years and years of great reviews. So you can service your own loan, have a long-term relationship with these guys, and they'll always take care of you. Remember who you are and make you feel like they're tiny, but they have 44 states with testimonials upon testimonials of success. Uh, it's better for the consumer. They, they're great for you. You're great for them. And th that's why we have this amazing relationship that's symbiotic. So Steve Carter is our own personal lo loan officer for Locked on Jazz. Call him at 385-800-8528 and make sure to tell him you are on Locked on Jazz. You listen to it all the time so you get the corporate discount. Uh, this is Intercap Lending, NMLS number 190465. For more inter information, visit intercaplending.com. I truly advise you guys to do that because Steve Carter is the best. All righty. Welcome back to Locked on Jazz. Uh, I also want to tell you guys, thank you for making Locked on Jazz your first listen of the day. And for your second listen, enjoy the Locked on NBA podcast. There's no offseason in the NBA and you guys know that better than anyone. We just saw a bunch of moves. There's no offseason. The NBA is everlasting, continuous. And Locked On NBA provides daily basketball analysis from national and local experts in 30 minutes or less. So no one keeps you as informed and as entertained as Locked On NBA. Available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. Welcome back to Locked On Jazz. And this is, this is a great quote. And in credit to Andy Larson. Who, who initially wrote this article and asked this question, I believe. And I, I and Will Hardy allows you into the, the press conferences and gives you tremendous sound bites. He's articulate, he's thorough, and he's poignant. He, he says his point, and you're like, okay, like he meant it, and there's meaning behind this. And here is why I bring this up. He talks about no free minutes. No free minutes. And jazz fans may bemoan this because you want the youngsters to play. But does it really help? So let me read you this quote. He, he said it a lot, by the way. Uh, and Will said this. Yeah, we're trying to win. This is not a laboratory. That being said, you're like, like you're allowed to make mistakes. I'm not a tyrant. Like every mistake you make, you're coming out. But you have to earn the right to play in the games. It's an honor to be in the NBA. It's an honor to be on an NBA roster. It's an honor to step on the court in an NBA game. And I want to create an environment where people work for it and it's not just handed to you. Like, oh, you're a high draft pick. And so you have to get the ball the whole time. So you can just get out, get to play, and you get to throw the ball into the stands 18 times and we don't care. There's moments that you're going to have to take a step back and you got to sit down. You're going to play less and you're not going to close the game. Certain people have earned the right over the course of their careers to have a little bit longer of a leash. That's just the way the league works. You've established your reputation. And so you get a few more bites at the apple. You get a little bit longer of a leash in that sense. 
And, and that's great. Like I, I think what he said it is great because the Jazz had expectations of winning. And the reason I think that this is going to be a debate between Jazz fans is the Jazz really didn't have a chance to win at a level that meant winning. But Will Hardy is a competitive guy who I think overachieved the past two seasons, picking at uh, ninth and 10th respectively, wasn't good for the Jazz because it's middle of the pack because it doesn't help you get the, the, the franchise star if you're the worst team ever and it doesn't help you win but he proved it. he can coach. And this is a way of proving he could coach. So the past two years, everyone had more Ochag Baji at the 14th pick who came out and was an All-American, most outstanding player on a national championship winning team on a team with minimal expectations in the Utah Jazz. Why was he in the G League at 22 years old? Personally, I was never all that high on Ochag, but you best believe I was annoyed. He wasn't playing because I wanted Wen Benyama desperately. I'm a draft guy and Wen Benyama is a freak. I will not apologize for that take. The Jazz overachieved, then came back to earth and plummeted, and then took Hendricks at nine and repeated the same path of G League, then starting for the final two months, and he has split up Jazz fans on their thoughts regarding him or expectations for him going forward versus what they've seen so far. As his numbers look solid, but the impact was not super loud, and the Jazz fans wanted him to play, and rightfully so, when playoff contention was nowhere near the Utah Jazz. This year, the offseason seems to indicate there's more time for Jazz rookies to learn and grow with less stakes. But in the past, uh, the two top picks the past two years, meaning Agbaji, I know the Jazz didn't pick him, so to, I'm not trying to get into that. That was the Cavaliers pick, but he was a high, highly regarded draft pick. And, of course, Hendricks, uh, the G League, I would say their seasons proved that the G League might have been the right place for them. Ochai was dealt in his second year. And frankly, Hendricks, to me, is a long way to go before saying the Jazz were inherently wrong to keep him there for as long as they did. But rhythm and confidence are funny things, playing basketball or any sport, but basketball in particular. And some react better to having the ball more in the G League and having the ability to, to play with the ball and, and, and gain confidence shooting a lot, having a large role. And others like the boost of playing sparingly in the NBA, but the pressure of needing to hit those shots that are not very many, like you're going to get minimal shots. If you make them, you look great. Your percentage is great. You get more shots. If you miss them, it can break your confidence. It's a it's a fickle thing. Basketball and confidence they go hand in hand. So let's let's get to the question of how will Will Hardy handle this trio of rookies and who all had flat all of whom had flashes in the summer league. Uh, Keontae George was the only player last year to play in the summer league uh, of the rookies. Sensible and Hendricks did not because they were they were nursing injuries. And Keontae played the entire season. I'm not saying that all of them will play the entire season because they had summer league success. No. Cody was great in an understated way in the summer league. Collier had turnover issues, but he showed he can ball out, get to the hole whenever he wants, and had flashes as a passer. And Flip played great in Vegas as a ball-handling five-man who can be a hub for the offense, a la Kelly Olenek. So here, here's what I what Andy Larson – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into an, another, another thing. Andy Larson talked about – uh, this, how it impacts Patty Mills and, and does Patty Mills playing uh, impact Collier's playing time? Does it impact Cody that Steve McKay looks there? We're going to talk about the next one, but here's another part of, of what Will Hardy said. That was another thing that Andy wrote in, in uh, last season. I believe it was around March. Uh, Hardy continued on saying what he said he, uh, about how playing time shouldn't just be handed over because of expectation. He said, I never wanted to just have a preconceived feeling for anybody like, oh, I can just get to play, especially with the younger players. If you want to be a real NBA player, you want to be a contributing NBA player. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of attention to detail. It takes the ability to be coached. You're going to fail some, of course. That's to be expected. But you you don't get to go through the motions and just get what you want. It doesn't mean you have to always be su uh, super successful in everything that you do. But you are going to do it with the right intent. Are you doing it with the right attitude, energy, competitiveness, and all those things? That's earning the right to play. A big thing for me is that from the development standpoint is that I, I, sorry, excuse me. A big thing for me from a development standpoint is, and it's never really talked about, you're not just helping them develop skills. I can dribble. I can pass. I can shoot. I can make that pass to the corner. That's part of it. But you're also helping them develop self-awareness. Like I, I don't have it going tonight. Maybe I got to get him involved. He's having a good night. 
you're still part of the team and you have to have some self-awareness of how you're fitting into the group uh, that night. It just can't be, oh, well, for my development, I'm going to go run 19 more pick and rolls and just shoot it every time because that's what I'm working on. Like, dude, it's not working for you right now. Th that is really, really important to me. And I know, I know I just read a huge thing. So thank you for Andy for, for posting this on your Twitter and, and asking the questions in those press conferences. And for those of you who don't listen to Will Hardy's press conferences, you're missing out. I, I've had the pleasure of going to them the last couple of years um, as my uh, role as a broadcast assistant and statistician. I, I go to attend games and, and I like to learn about the jazz. And one thing about Will Hardy is he doesn't really mince words. He's pretty, he's pretty straight with you. He, there's a lot of candor with him. Um, but the reason I bring that up is because it, it means that the Jazz could have a longer leash in comparison with the rookies than the prior years because I don't think there's as much talent on the roster, and they can prove that they can do the intangible things that Will Hardy covets consistently. But as the Jazz figure to lose a lot, I think there'll be less scoreboard indications that say, that take this guy out of the game because they're really sucking um, or they're really playing great. I think there's going to be less of like, oh, well, the Jazz are better with this guy on the bench or this guy on the floor. Like, it's not going to be as cut and dry. Thus, that allows for more confidence to be built through playing time while hot or cold. Uh, hot or cold. I, I do personally think that a consistency of minutes for young players is great and it at least tells them like, hey, I'm playing 20 minutes tonight. I'm going to get my 20 minutes. I don't have to worry about this shot, meaning that like it determines my playing time for a week. I think it establishes a sense of calm rather than a missed shot spells the end of playing time in a punitive fashion. Like everyone's played high school ball and they've had a, had a coach where they, they instill confidence into you and you know how great it feels. But if you miss and another coach just says, well, uh, there's a turnover, you're out of the game, it feels horrible. You didn't mean to turn it over. It's the NBA, of course. Like it's not high school. It's not about feelings right here. But I do think confidence is key. And I think the Jazz as rookies will have more of an immediate uh, – pathway to playing with less players that can push them for time. But that doesn't mean that the player signs, Svi Mikhailuk, uh, Patty Mills, Johnny Juzang don't have an avenue to play. Drew Eubanks over Filipowski. So we're going to talk about that, those equations, how, what's going to factor into that decision coming up next. So welcome back to Locked on Jazz. Uh, Leaf Tulane here with you. Patty Mills, to me, would be the embodiment of no free minutes, both early in his career, finding time on a loaded Spurs team, but now he figures to be an extension of the coach on the court. So I would not be shocked by this at all. If he takes a lot of minutes I previously expected would belong to Isaiah Collier in the second unit as the point guard because he runs the team better and helps the other young guys play uh play out in a controlled fashion more so than Collier who at times resembles a whirling dervish and his peaks and valleys may lead to inconsistencies for himself along with other players. This is not an indictment on Collier, um, but no free minutes will be a way to justify for Collier, justify minutes for Collier as he has a point guard and Mills is actually a two. And it'll be a test to see if Collier can learn and eventually surpass Mills in minutes played at the point guard. Likewise, Drew Eubanks figures to get a lot of backup five minutes, in my opinion, because of energy and physicality. Two areas where I think Filipowski is lacking are strength and defense. And I would say overall athleticism favors Eubanks. Eubanks isn't going to make the Jazz so much better that they win extra games. Like he's not a, a ceiling raiser as a player, but what he is is he's more established in the NBA and Filipowski is going to have growing pains. So I, I think Eubanks will play more to begin the season. That leads me to believe at least early in the year, the minutes will be in favor of Eubanks. And toward the end of the season, I expect the minutes to consistently be there for Filipowski. I expect there to be more minutes for Filipowski earlier in the season than maybe you anticipate, but I think it will favor Eubanks still slightly. I think by the end of the season, Filipowski will not be just playing those two months. I think he'll be playing four months of basketball of the season, as opposed to the two months that you saw from Bryce Sensible who was picked in a similar range. He was picked 28th. Philip House, he was 32nd. Now, where I think this train of vets being in front of the line and where it ends is Cody Williams. I don't think he's going to be boxed out of playing time by Svi Mikhailuk or Johnny Juzang. Despite not being as good of a shooter as either of those two, because Mikhailuk can really shoot and Juzang can really shoot, Williams has desirable traits that need confidence to cultivate. 
And the Jazz need him to be that guy that they drafted, that they would have drafted at number two. Like they really loved him along with Stefan Castle. They need to, to cultivate those traits that they loved. And I think you saw it in the summer league. He's got a quiet confidence, but it's, it's kind of an understated way of dominating the game. Like I, I talked with uh, James Barlow on NBA Big Board about how both of us would have taken him five uh, after the, the summer league, even though his stats were not pedestrian, but they weren't super loud like some other players had in individual games or even in the entirety of the summer league that were inflated by an individually brilliant game. That was a one-off game. Williams has desirable traits that have to be cultivated even at Colorado. He played a similar role to what I envision him playing for the Jazz, both in his rookie season and down the road. But he needed to be confident with the ball. At times when he was healthy, he was the guy who would attack the rim. He was the guy who would be the isolation mismatch because, yes, they had K.J. Simpson, who was a second-round pick, Tristan Silva, who was a top-20 pick, but and they were both veterans, fifth year and fourth year, respectively. You you look at you look at that team and you say, well, who's the guy who's the nightmare matchup? Well, it's Cody Williams. So let's let's isolate him and let him do his thing. Oh, what who's the guy on our team that can present the most issues for the player on their team that is the hardest to guard? Oh, Cody Williams. So we're gonna have him defend a 94 feet, and then on the other side of the ball, he's gonna space and attack closeouts. He can run, pick and roll. He's going to do a lot of different things because his some of his best traits aren't as strong as some other players in the draft or even on the NBA team on the Jazz is best trait. But it's that he has more that he's good at um, than just about anyone in this draft. And on most rosters, if you were to take him from a blank slate, if you were to take him from when they were picked, he's got more that he's 70th percentile in coming into the league than most players do because He's got a lot to work with. And, and I think this is a notion, a slight sidetrack here. When, when he attacks off the bounce, he's really, really solid at it. He just needs to get stronger. I've talked about this tons of times that the, the thing he needs to improve the most, speaking of Cody Williams, is strength because it makes so many aspects of his game that are either, either strengths better and weaknesses disappear. So unlike Hendricks, Agbaji, or Sensaba, who have been the previous wings that the Jazz have drafted or acquired, uh, Williams is not a guy who I think is pigeonholed into the role of three and D where he has deficiencies on one side of that equation, three point shooting or defensive ability, and is not ready because they're better because they're better players at one side of the game. Well, his game has far more versatility than the previously mentioned guys that are labeled as three and D guys because their builds had success. Their builds resembled guys who had success on one side who had similar builds. For instance, we talked about Hendricks emulating McDaniels. We talked about Agbaji looking like Reggie Bullock or Danny Green, who are or the upper, upper echelon of 3 and D. But if you look at those guys, I think 3 and D, I'll just be frank, I think 3 and D is an overrated thing in the NBA draft community and an overused uh, sell on players league-wide because 3 and D players often are deficient on one side of that equation. And then, therefore, they're relegated to the corner on offense if they can't do anything with the ball and and are either a good shooter or a bad shooter. They have to hit that corner three, and it's a dare shot or it's one that teams are fearful of. And then if they're fearful of that three-point shooting, unless you're the upper, upper echelon where you're a true two-way wing, then they're hit on, hit it on defense. Like, for instance, the best example of this is probably the premier 3 and D offensively in the NBA is Michael Porter Jr. The Jazz hunted him relentlessly in the bubble, absolutely relentlessly. I say all of this to say this. I don't think Cody, whether he shoots well or poorly, will be kept off the court. I think he plays from day one and the minutes may grow as the year goes by, but the Jazz will not have as precipitous of a drop in level of play that they have had intentionally the past two seasons, which has coincided with the rookies getting more playing time. That that's the reason the Jazz have fallen off. It, it's it's not because the rookies are playing more. It's because the Jazz have intentionally pulled the plug. Lowry Marketing plays less. Jordan Clarkson's played less. Mike Conley and Kelly Olynyk at different years were were not on the roster. It, it's not it's not about the rookies playing more. So this year, because the Jazz know that the Western Conference is so strong, they know what the best decision for their franchise is going to be. I think you're going to see Cody Williams play the entire season. I think he will play more down the road. I think you'll see Kyle Filipowski play more later, but I don't think he's going to be relegated to the G League entirely. Co- Isaiah Collier, I thought, had the clearest path to, to playing in terms of position prior to Patty Mills, and and maybe you you say, well, we, we, Clarkson might run some guard. Maybe, maybe you'll see a little Collier in the G League because 
not because Patty Mills is such an amazing presence at 36 years old, but just because you want to cultivate Collier's decision-making with the ball in his hands because that's what he's best at. That makes sense. But I also think you're going to see him play alongside, maybe even surpass Patty Mills' playing time come January, which is far sooner than you saw it with even Taylor Hendricks, who was the ninth pick of the draft last year. I mean, I've gone off off the topic a little bit, but I'm curious to see what Lowry's minutes total will be uh, in – and how much it needs to dip in order to be as bad as the Jazz need to be to get to the promised land that they want to get to. I'm curious to see how the minutes will shift when or if Jordan Clarkson is dealt. Does the addition of Patty Mills, and and though I'd love to see him lean into mentorship and want to see Collier take up the backup one minutes, does that happen with Jordan Clarkson Clarkson still on the roster if he's not dealt? Does, if Jordan Clarkson is dealt, how quickly – does Isaiah Collier assume those minutes that will be vacated by Clarkson? Because you can still expect him to play upper 20s, maybe low 30s of minutes. I, I mean, it's it's an interesting question of how the Jazz are going to prioritize the development versus satisfying some of the veteran guys. And I, I'd love to see the mentorship side of Patty Mills, and I think we will. I wonder how much he plays towards the end of the year because you'd think, okay, well, that's when he'd play when the Jazz have pulled the plug. I think that'll be when he sits back and you see uh, Isaiah Collier run the ship nonstop. Uh, is Mills or Sensabaugh impacted by Clarkson's minutes? If if those get dealt, does Bryce Sensabaugh play a lot? Does Fima Kailuk and Johnny Juzem, do they block off Sensabaugh playing minutes because he's also an excellent shooter? I, I don't know. These will all be questions. Ash, but I think it's going to be apparent that the Jazz will play more minutes sooner for rookies and more minutes later for rookies, and it won't be as stark of a contrast beginning of the year to the end of the year. It'll be more gradual in nature. In sum, there are a lot of moving pieces to the Jazz as we speak, and I know we want to see the youth play, and I I think that we will see, but these signings not only fill out the Jazz roster, both in terms of they need to have a such and such amount of players, but it gives internal competition pacing the growth of the players you want to see, just like a good bike race. You look at the Tour de France, there's pacers. The guy that you think is going to win needs a training partner, needs someone to set a pace for them to to reach and have as their their internal competition and helps them throughout a season. In a bike race, you have a guy who sets the pace, and then you have a guy at the end, if you're working in a team, that puts the pedal to the metal and ends up winning. You hope that's the rookie who ends up winning that competition because they're young, and that's what you hope for as a Jazz fan. That means that the Jazz's ceiling down the road will be higher as opposed to a veteran. But you need someone to put that competition, put that fire in the, the gut of Cody Williams, in the gut of Isaiah Collier, in the gut of Kyle Filipowski. They need to have someone who can take those minutes so it's not just handed. So there are no free minutes. We need the Jazz as veterans that we just signed recently, and I talked about at the beginning of this episode, to be like the Pacers in the Tour de France. So interesting analogy there, and I'm excited to see what comes for both the rookies, but also the guys that the Jazz signed, and maybe one of them will be a steal. They found the right spot. Simone Fontecchio was similar. The Jazz found him, and now he's signed for a $16 million deal. Two year, sixteen million. You, you didn't expect that when you signed Fontecchio. So sometimes you get a golden, golden prize when you don't, when you least expect it. So thanks as always for listening, you guys. It always uh, is appreciated by me and the entirety of Locked On Network, and of course by David on Locked On Jazz. Thank you again for making Locked On Jazz your first listen today. And now go check out Locked On NBA podcast, where the season never ends, providing national expertise with a local perspective. You can find the link on Locked On NBA in the description, so you don't need to search. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you guys for listening. I always really appreciate it. Um, And you guys know me. At the end of this, as always, I'm right there with you. And I need the Jazz to do great to make me happy. So go Jazz.